We love a mission patch and both have plenty in our collections, but what does one do with all these incredible pieces of art? Well, today we talked to Logan Yaron, who has a huge collection which he is using to attempt to inspire the next generation. What do you do with your mission patches? Let us know via our social media pages at Space and Things Podcast on Threads, Instagram, and Facebook, or via the contact form on our website. And please consider joining us over at patreon.com forward slash space and things. But right now, it's time for episode 182 of the Space and Things podcast. Oh my God. Carney and Dave Giles. I'm Emily Carney. And I'm Dave Giles, and welcome to episode 182 of our podcast, Blink and You'll Miss It. Anyway, how are you doing, Emily? How was your birthday? It was magnificent. Uh, Thanks for everybody who reached out and wished me a happy birthday. Uh, I really appreciate it. I'm genuinely touched by all the wonderful wishes, but obviously we, me and my uh, sister, my niece, we went to Disney World and we had, we did both parks. If I sound out of it during this episode, I am still exhausted, but it was a wonderful time. We had a great time and it was, it was well worth all the blisters I have on my feet right now. So we had a spectacular (laughs) weekend. So that's, that's such a classic Emily answer. That is those of, those of you who follow Emily on social media, you will know that for her, Disney World is just two parks. Uh, and and if you know her, you know you don't have to answer. Ask which of those parks it is. The others don't exist. There are no, only two. <laughs> there are only yeah. two, and the rest aren't even worth considering. And I love that. And I, yeah, I love there's that only did, two parks. Yeah, we did both the parks. She didn't say we did two of the four parks. She said, no, we did both of the parks. It's such an Emily answer. I love that. Those are the two parks to me that exist. Um, yeah. <laughs> I am interested in going to perhaps one of the other parks that kind of, that, <laughs> oh, I kind wanna, of, that I will. That's, that that's an admission that they exist. <laughs> yeah, that I, I acknowledge that it's part of Disney World, but the other park, I'm not. I don't know. We have a similar park in Tampa that I've gone to, and I'm kind of just like, mm, I don't know. We'll figure it out. But yeah, I went to the the two bigs. I guess I don't know what to call. Them. The sad thing is I'm so old that those were the only parks from, that we had back in the day. So that's why I, I'm like, yeah, we went to both the parks. That's how old I am. <laughs> Absolutely love it. Before we get started, I just want to thank those who have signed up to our Patreon page this week. I think we've had four new people sign up, so that's good. We're getting closer to our target, just 15 people away now from uh, from hitting our target, which we've got still got 19 weeks for. So if you haven't considered doing it or if you want to find out more, head over to patreon.com forward slash space things. Or if you've got any questions about what it means, what, what it actually does, feel free to just to send us a message as well and just ask about it. We're happy to answer any questions you have. So feel free to get in contact. But thank you to those who are continuing to sign up and, and those who have been involved for a while now. It really, really does mean a lot. As we finish recording this, Emily and I are going to do our little book draw for our prize draw for our patrons uh, that, will, that will go up this week in the Patreon group as well. Anyway, let's crack on with this week's topic. As we said in the intro, today we're going to learn how Logan Yaron is using his mission patches to inspire the next generation with his new non, non-for-profit Steam for Space. Yes. Each mission patch has a story behind it, so why not tell those stories to help create unforgettable learning experiences It's pretty special what Logan is doing, so we're going to let him do the talking today and get straight to the interview. So, Dave, let's crack on. Where cracking on is a celebrated event. This is Space and Things. So, welcome, Logan, and thank you so much for joining us today. So, let's start at the beginning. How did you get into spaceflight? You know, my uh, my maternal grandfather uh, was a mechanical engineer, worked for North American Rockwell. And so he worked on the heat shield wow. assembly for the command module of all of the Apollo missions, including also Skylab and ASTP. Went on to work on uh, the engineering for the thermal tiles for Columbia before he retired. And so that's my family connection, my personal connection um, to to the space flight. And, you know, he, he gifted me a collection of patches when I was like seven, eight years old that he had collected and purchased from the Downey plant at North American Rockwell. For me, it's clearly, that was how I got in, engaged in space. And I also attribute my first grade teacher for 
encouraging her students to be interested in uh, in space flight by uh, constructing a uh, service and command module out of refrigerator boxes that were highly (laughs) decorated. So yeah, my early life was very much uh, into space. So tell us about your mission patch collection. How many did you end up with? I've actually lost count, um, (laughs) but I continue to collect. So, you know, there was a a period of about almost 50 years between the time I got, I was gifted patches from my grandfather uh, until about five years ago. Uh, I was in summer of 2018, I was at Kennedy Space Center for the very first time and found myself sort of transfixed in the gift shop looking at patches. Uh, My patch collection, my grandfather gifted me was stolen, stolen when I was a young adult. And though that was a loss, the memories that they held is still vivid and true for me. But when I was looking at the patches in the gift shop, I thought, mm, maybe, maybe I should, uh, uh, I hadn't thought about starting a collection until two hours later, I was walking out of the gift shop with, with the NASA cinch bag full of goodies. That's kind of how it started. It, and it actually where my interests went from there had more to do with, I was, I was really interested in the design. Uh, and it was, wasn't something I was really interested in as a kid, although I, you know, I would, uh, sketch designs from patches that my grandfather gave me, but I was really interested in the backstory. Well, I'm more interested in the artwork and the, the meaning behind the design that kind of took me on a, on literally on a trajectory that I just really didn't know where that was going to go. So that's how it started. That was summer 2018. I sat on those patches for about a year and I thought, you know, uh, I started doing research on the stories behind the patches. And as I started to learn more about the backstories, some of the hidden gems, the hidden figures, literally of some stories behind the designs and, and was gaining an appreciation for their design. Uh, I started sharing those stories with others. People found them interesting and fascinating. And so, yeah, December of 2019, really, I decided I was going to go on a on a path, on a mission to be able to share those stories. That took me down the path of creating a website called Space Exploration Patches. And my goal there was to essentially start to scan uh, the patches, start to publish the stories behind their design and some of the human interest stories behind the missions. Fast forward to today, I have somewhere between four and 5,000 patches. Just a couple then, just a couple, just one or two. Just a few. Yeah, <laughs> just a few. How, how do you store that many patches? Uh, uh, you know, I think I've made a small investment in my local hardware store and Sterilite boxes right now. Uh, so uh, I have them actually categorized uh, and kind of catalog. Nice. Um, but I'm way behind the curve right now uh, because I've been, so, I've been so involved in other pursuits that started from that, right? Started from like, hey, you know, I'm going to set myself on a four year journey of cataloging my collection. My meanwhile, my collection kept growing. I found myself lacking the time, uh, to adequately do the research that I felt like was needed in order to renew interest in space through the stories that these patches tell. That took me in a, that took me in a direction. I didn't think I, I'd go. It, it has been a journey. It has been a journey. Like I said, you know, 2019 is when I started building the website which is called sxpatches.com on July 20th of 2020 is when I launched that site. And then about six months later, I started, as I was collecting patches, I had a lot of surplus. I had a lot of duplicates. I'm thinking what I'm going to do with these. What I decided to do was to try to recruit or partner with educators and their students to help me do research and publish and give them due credit, but also publish the human interest stories that they would uncover. That's what led me to starting to give patches away to educators was in early uh, 2022, actually, it's when Mm. I started. So let's talk about STEAM for Space. So what exactly are you trying to do with it? So STEAM for Space is a mission to take the stories, uh, to actually put actual mission patches uh, physically into the hands of students. And the goal there is to actually, uh, transcend the experience that students have, young people have with something that's physical. Yeah. So all of this space shuttle mission patches 
all have digital graphic artwork it's in the public domain. It's easily accessible. What's missing uh, is the fact that holding an actual patch of looking at the light reflecting off the embroidery really starts to create this personal and emotional connection to what they're looking at. But it actually starts to make it much more of a physical experience and an emotional experience. So it creates this personal connection. And after discovery that, you know, validating, yes, this is true. And it really changes, I think, the student's perspective on, on the pouches themselves. With that introduction of something that's physical that you could hold in your hand, now, you know, those students are more open to hearing the story behind what they're looking at. And then um, creating a bridge from that story of the design and the people involved with it to creating bridges to STEM. Because every mission has behind it, you know, has three to 12 experiments or that were related payloads of each of the shuttle missions uh, and all the people who are behind it. Uh, so the fact that there's 135 space shuttle missions, there is literally like three to 10 or more patches related to all the experiments, the science, the payloads. That is where the STEM is. That is where the science, the technology, and engineering, and mathematics are hidden. So going well beyond just the flight and the crew, I started to realize that being able to introduce patches to educators and tell the stories that those patches tell became an effective hook. It really became a, a new way for educators to spark curiosity uh, on the part of their students. And so that led me to really, really starting to reinvest my effort and energy into trying to get more patches and more students. Fantastic. We just had a, a question sent to us from Anne Siddiquist. She said, um, your work with patches and steam is exposing many kids to space and engaging them in ways that she doesn't think you envisioned when you first started the project. So can you talk about what you think would happen versus what is actually happening? Well, I was being a little more self-centered at the time where I was thinking of my own collection wanting to share that collection out with others, but more importantly, rather than just showing a picture of a patch, I wanted to know more about the people that, that it represents and more of the story. I just found it, I found the stories interesting. So I became more of a, as much of a story collector mm. as a patch collector, where I just didn't know where this was going to go was the fact that space hipsters, that became my channel were connecting with educators who had a passion for space. So the enthusiasm that those educators have that were part of space hipsters was my ability to connect with a, I think an enthusiastic pool of people. Yeah. And the goal was actually is to invite them, uh, to hear my stories and to share with them the stories and that hopefully use that as a way to inspire their students to see space in a slightly different way. And while the goal was to essentially donate patches, I was doing that out of pocket and I wasn't becoming sustainable, but out of the, out of the process, out of the effort of donating mission patches to educators, one such educator, Molly Nipper, who lives in Houston, invited me to co-present, uh, at the space exploration, uh, educators conference seat, which is hosted at the space center in Houston every year in early February. Uh, in fact, just a week before last, I was there again. And that was in 2023 was the first year. By that time, I had spent a year donating patches to educators. But when she invited me to, to co-present with her, and then the presentation was about using patches in the classroom and sharing the stories with the educators, got them excited. I was on a high. I was just on an emotional high because what I didn't expect was that the feedback I was getting from educators was that what I was introducing them to was a completely different approach to engaging students and their curiosity. And that was something that was missing. Uh, educators have a lot of resources and support methodologies where, you know, teaching STEM. But what I discovered was that they struggled to try to figure out how to get kids interested in the first place. Mm. And so that actually was the catalyst. That presentation was the catalyst for me to create Steam for Space. And from that point, I had already developed a close relationship with Tim Gagnon, you know, premier emblem designer 
right? And he taught me a lot about symbology and elements and, and shared with, with me his stories. But he put me in touch with uh, the co-CEO of AB Emblem, right. uh, Andrew Nagel. And Andrew really uh, was in, in support of my journey and what I was trying to do. But at the same time, I also was going to help him solve the problem. And the problem was is he had tens of thousands of souvenir patches in his uh, warehouse that some of them have been in, in storage for over 30 years. And he had all this surplus. It was not going to sell it. Uh, these, these patches, they were marked for donation to educators who contacted the company. Um, but by that time I had already given patches to over a hundred educators in multiple countries and different countries around the world. He made it possible for me to essentially continue this mission of getting patches into the hands of, of, of students. And, uh, I would now present day, I donated over. 23,000 patches uh, wow. to 560 plus educators in 24 different countries. That's amazing. Between uh, space hipsters, which allowed me to connect with educators, Molly, who invited me to, to join her on, on, on the journey of getting in front of educators and sharing what I thought was, was a promising and beneficial approach to getting students interested in space. And then with Tim's uh, referral to Andrew and Andrew at AV Emblem providing me with the patches that I'm now the official distributor of patches to educators. So any educator that contacts AV Emblem gets referred to me and, you know, they make a request and I send them out a classroom set of 40 patches. Wow. It, it's hard to know where this is going to go, uh, but I'm having so much fun and I'm getting a, such positive response. And this is making a difference. Absolutely. D just one, one little thing. Have you always had a background in education or is it, or is this a, a new thing? I'm not a certified teacher. Right. I've had a 35 year career in designing software. Okay. So I have a degree in geology. I developed educational software that lured me into doing that. I really like the design process and creating, creating software. And so I'm now at a place in my career where you know, I'm leading teams of designers to create software uh, yeah. in different industries. But uh, education has always been near and dear to my heart. Mm -hmm. Had life been different and opportunities availed themselves in different ways, I certainly would have been a teacher, um, a, fu a full-time teacher. But I'm now in the place in my life and my career where I have the good fortune of being able to invest myself in a different way in education and in a way that kind of feeds off my own personal passion. But at the same time, I'm making a difference in a way that I didn't foresee. And so yeah. how that difference has come to pass, um, and it come to fruition has been in large part because of the people I know, uh, and the opportunities I've been able to be blessed with. So right before you spoke to us today, you were talking to an eighth grade class alongside Apollo 13 astronaut Fred Hayes. So how did that go and... You know, are you doing many of these types of things now? Uh, you know, I am. Uh, so Fred and I became fast friends about two years ago. And in fact, it happened to be at a uh, holiday trivia event that Space Hipsters hosted, in which Fred, you know, back in, what, December of 2021, he, he spoke to the Space Hipsters group and essentially elaborated on, the, on his upcoming book. And he mentioned during that, that period, he mentioned that he was wanting, there was content that wasn't going to be in his book and archives that he actually went and put out on a website. And so uh, I reached out to Fred. It was to kind of a cold message. just like, Hey, you know, I'm th this is an area of my expertise. I'm happy to consult with you. Eight months later, uh, we launched a site coincidentally out of it. I spent like half a day in a Starbucks in Slidell, Louisiana. And after the, the launching of the site, I drove through Biloxi, Mississippi, his hometown. Only for my phone to start blowing up because I had called Fred and said, Hey, go, go for it. You know, let's go for launch, you know, let other, other people know. And that was the start of a relationship, a friendship, uh, with Fred, which is, uh, you know, for me, it's, it's, it's a unique friendship. But what I found is I found that he was actually, he has done a lot of speaking engagements and presentations to classrooms. And that was something that, um, I was also very much interested in doing more of. I had done it in a small way in my local community, 
but I was intrigued by what Fred was doing with you know, t- yeah, presenting to classrooms. Um, and so we, we've actually worked together. I've created a kind of a format of presentation to talk about Apollo 13 and also aspect of his it, career with, uh, with the approach and landing tests. And about, yeah, today we actually, just before this interview, we, we presented to three third grade classes at a, oh, uh, third grade. at a magnet school in Glendale, California, and shared with them the story of Fred and Apollo 13 had this half hour long Q and a session that Fred had with the class. And yes, we plan on doing actually more of that. The paths and the interests are sort of interwoven. You know, this is something that Fred enjoys doing. I'm happy to be a facilitator to help make that happen. And I'm now continuing that connection that I've made through giving patches to educators and providing them with lesson plan uh, to support that. It's now coming full circle where, you know, there's opportunities for Fred and I to address the classes directly and to continue to spread the word of that space is for everyone. Fantastic. Um, yeah, you just actually asked the, answered a question from uh, one of our patrons, Rachel, there as well. So um, well done. That was a great answer. He's so good at answering two questions. We always love answers like that. Uh, big fans. Okay. We actually, literally, as I'm just sitting here right now, we just had a message from one of our patrons, Don Irwin. He says, first of all, thank you, because he is a recipient of your generosity with the patches and he has used them. Um, but here's a few questions. Was there a teacher or hands-on lesson in some part of your education that may have inspired you to give back in this way? I would have to give credit to Mrs. Gilbert, my first grade teacher from Lincoln Elementary in Anaheim, California. Amazing. Do you have a favorite mission patch or type of patch? Yes. So my favorite mission patch is actually Apollo 13. And that has nothing to do with my relationship with with Fred. It, It was always my favorite. I never... I can never recall why, but out of the set of patches my grandfather gave me, that was the one that I really was drawn to. So our final question is, um, can anyone get involved with STEAM for space? How does one get involved with that? You know, I'd have to kind of ask back, like what kind of involvement uh, is of interest? I think the involvement for STEAM for space in general is to support educators, support STEAM, and to act as an advocate for sharing uh, space and the enthusiasm for space and support your, you know, your local teachers, Re- reach out to them and get involved in that way. In terms of my actual program, it's still in the early days. It's still kind of, it's still getting legs and it's still for me uh, in that regard. Well, thank you very, very much for joining us. I see on the website, it says that you're hoping to fully launch everything by the end of this month. Yes. Um, so that's that's exciting. And we, we really love this idea. We're absolutely thrilled that you're doing it. And I've been following uh, on Space Hipsters what you've been doing and, and all the posts you've been doing. So I think it's wonderful. And I'm really glad we're able to get you on to talk about it. And I'm sure I speak to family on, on this as well, that we just wish you all the best with it. Because I just think it's absolutely amazing. So thank you very much for talking to us about it today. And, and thank you for doing it. Because I think it's, it's one of those, we get asked a lot, what can I do to help inspire people? And, and you've just taken that on yourself. You've gone, right, what have I got and how can I do it? And I think I love that, that, that idea of just saying, no, this is what I've got. These are the stories I've got to tell from this, from this amazing resource that I've built up. Yeah. And this is what I, this is what I want to do. So thank you very much for joining us. And, and we hope to speak to you again sometime very soon. Thank you very much. It was a pleasure. Where things meet space, this is space and things. So I love that Logan started his patch collection in the same way, well, other than the ones that his granddad gave him, but in the same way that I have envisioned that I am going to start my own patch collection of some magnitude of patches by being in the Kennedy Space Center store and standing there at the patch wall and just being like, I think I want all of them. Uh, <laughs> and and yeah. he actually left the store, came back and then picked them all up and left with a huge bag full of them. I love that. And and because I I've always thought, oh, that'd be amazing. It's so cool to have them all. I'd love to have them all. What what would I do with them? Uh, and I've got a fair few, but I don't have anywhere near the numbers he was talking about. But I love the fact he's turned this into something 
and it's actually making a difference. I just think it's wonderful. Yeah, I've spent many an hour in front of that wall at Kennedy Space Center. Yeah. Like, man, I haven't bought all the patches, but I bought, like I said, a great, probably a great number of them, you know, just because I'm like, man, I, I want to get this specific patch. Patches are definitely, I think, a gateway drug into space flight for a lot of people. You know, I, I've, in hipsters, we've had a lot of conversations about um, patches, particularly lesser seen patches. Um, there are a lot of patches out there that are quite obscure, that are really cool. Not many of them were produced that I'm just like, I don't know anything about this. This is really cool. And it, it is more than possible for you to go see these things and just be like, what's that? And get curious about it. And then find out more about the actual mission and the science behind it. Patches are definitely a huge, I hate to use this term, gateway drug into just space flight in general. I, I think, and and plus they're cool to look at. They're fun to put on your jacket, you know, um, space hipsters. We've ha we've have our own, you know, group patches and, and patches for special things in the past. It's just a lot of fun. It gives people something to identify with, I think, too. I, I think they give astronauts sort of a mission identity, you know, of, okay, this is what our mission is, what it looks like. And I think with um, patches for even a community group, it's the same thing. It gives people kind of an identity of, okay, this is who we are. And I think that's really important to people. They like having something to identify with, something to say, okay, this is something I'm into. So I think what Logan is doing is really awesome. It's really cool for kids. I think it's cool because it sort of introduces younger people to that concept of, okay, this is something we can all identify with. And what is this mission about? You know, how do we teach this mission what it did do? So I think that's really awesome. Absolutely. So for those uh, of you been wondering, STEAM for Space, what, is it, what does it stand for? Is it just uh, a, a fun name? Well, it actually does stand for something. A lot of people will know what STEAM stands for, Science, Technology, Engineering, Arts and Maths. And obviously for space, you would think, oh, it's just well, all of that for space. But Logan has actually even created an acronym with the word space. So it's for Student Project and Activities Centers on Exploration. And I think that's uh, pretty fun. So he's got a huge, big play on words with, within his uh, title as well. So there was something else that, that Logan said within this interview, which struck me when that was, we said, having something physical in your hand, seeing how the light bounces off of it and really can help captured your imagination and to me I found that interesting because it ties in with something that Dr. Jennifer said last week in our interview where she was talking about the IMAX camera and how you could look at all that because it was handmade you could see the tool in and uh, how impressive that is and then suddenly there's a human story behind the camera it's not just a camera because you can see exactly where this heart this 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 Handy workers come into play. I, I think that's the cool thing about a physical patch as well. Taking it off the screen is it's not just about the design. It's it's about so much of what does the mission mean, and then what does it physically embody, and that, and that patch just gives it that little thing that we can all connect with physically to to feel like we're part of it. Which is similar to what you were saying, Emily, as well, wasn't it? Yeah, it's a human connection, and I a I think, human connection. Yeah. I think sometimes in space flight or in any career that is more science or engineering oriented, I think sometimes that's forgotten. You know, people forget that there's people, it might be partly robotic, but there are people behind these missions who are working on them. And yeah, that you like seeing sort of a human touch and the patches, they're embroidered. You know, a lot of them have, you know, special sort of hidden features. A lot of them, you know, I know, for example, the Apollo 15 patches, has a Roman numeral 15, if you look very closely, little things like that, really kind of neat little touches. It, it really lets you know that, okay, this is a space mission, but there are people behind it who are working on every facet of it, you know, yeah. including the mission patch and the the look of the mission, if that the aesthetic, I guess. Yep, and uh, plenty of stories to be told, and Logan is doing his best to do it, which I, which is great. So thank you, Logan. Of course, for those who are interested, you can watch the full unedited interview with Logan uh, on our Patreon page, patreon.com forward slash space and things. And I will put links to all things Steam for Space and Logan in the show notes. If you find that, just click on the link in the description of this podcast in your podcast provider, or go to space and things podcast. 
Com. Uh, but yeah, that's where you'll find. And uh, uh, as we said in the interview, the full launch of Logan's website should be happening at the end of this month. So next week, hopefully. From Gagarin to Shatner, this is the Space and Things podcast. So, Emily, what has caught your eye in spaceflight this week? I'm going to keep it short and sweet, but um, I wanted to give a follow up on the last week's story about Voyager 1. Uh, Mystery and Trollers are still trying to get um, uh, a fix for the computer glitch that's going on with Voyager 1. Unfortunately, it does not look very promising. So this article basically discusses, you know, is it time to call curtains on Voyager 1? The answer is right now they're not sure yet. One of the uh, mission engineers, whose name is Kareem Badarudin, has said in the Space.com article, the team is tired because we have sustained a brisk pace for three months now. But we press on because we have ideas and we have hope. And he added the crew working on uh, this Voyager 1 uh, hiccup. It said, don't forget Voyager 2 is still going strong. So if we can keep one spacecraft going, the mission will continue. Just as a reminder, the Voyagers launched in the fall of, I believe, August and September 1977. So they've been up there for nearly 47 years. They're older than me. I just turned 46, which is pretty wild. 1970s tech is pretty robust, although I have to admit the 15 plus miles of walking at Disney this weekend about did me in. So (laughs) we're getting a little older is what I'm trying to say. Getting a little creakier, getting a little more arthritic, which is fine. That's normal. But Still, it's kind of an engineering marvel that the spacecraft have gone as long as that. That's really not heard of. And that kind of tells you how well built they were and also how well maintained they've been since they've been in space by the people working on the mission. So um, I'm going to keep giving updates uh, about Voyager 1 as we receive them. I'm sure we'll probably receive more in the next few weeks, but don't count it out officially yet. Um, unless I'm hoping it's not counted out in the next two days before our publication. That would suck. But uh, don't count it out just yet. They're still trying to work that problem with the pro. So, Dave, what has caught your eye this week? Uh, A couple of things. I I do think it would be great if we could get someone who's been working on Voyager, either currently or historically, and and talk to them about them. It's something we I don't think we've done. Uh, we've, We've talked about Voyager a lot, but I don't think we've ever spoken to someone who directly worked on on those. So I think that's something we should definitely try and do. Um, yes, in, in, agreed. In terms of what caught my eye this week, I am still doing the refurb on my studio, so I haven't been keeping too much of an eye on, on what's going on. However, I did see a, th- a post about the new Glenn rocket being put on the, the launch pad over at Kennedy Ooh. Space Center. So I think it's just a, a test article. I'm not entirely sure as I haven't looked, but there have been some activity with Blue Origin's new Glenn rocket, rocket, and it looks like we might get to a point where we're going to see another massive rocket launch from Kennedy Space Center. So that's good news. We've been talking about this rocket for a while. Obviously, we saw that the engines it's using uh, were successful on the Vulcan flight earlier this year. So hopefully... Um, some good good moves from Blue Origin. Also, currently, uh, there is an, another mission about to land on the moon, or hopefully try and land on the moon, uh, by Intuitive Machines. It's their Nova Sea moon lander called Odysseus, and it should touch down on September. Uh, I'm sorry, on February 22nd. And this is another robotic spacecraft. Yep. Land on the moon has been proven to be very difficult recently, and this is going to land at the most southern point that anything has ever attempted to land or has successfully landed. So it's certainly going to be challenging. Uh, and obviously it's their first attempt in, in this company uh, for this company. So hopefully they'll get it right. But obviously we know space is hard and we've seen enough yeah. values recently. But hopefully intuitive machines will be having a successful touchdown some point on the 22nd of February. Yep. Fingers crossed. Are you dreaming of a holiday to the ISS? Well, you've come to the right place. This is Space and Things. Okay, that's it for this week. Thank you for joining us. We'll be back next week with another interview which we recorded at the Smithsonian last month. Emily, I can't believe it's been a month already. I know. It's crazy. Uh, I'm still really processing my trip there. So, yeah, I can't believe it's been a month. So, thank you all for listening and supporting our podcast. We really do appreciate it. But don't forget, in space, no one can hear you mean. 
Thanks for listening to the Space and Things podcast. Back next week with a whole lot more.